So you're welcome everyone. I can see people joining us. Um, thank you for joining us for the final day of International Dark Sky Week and what a week it has been for Ireland. Um, we have a very detailed programme for you tonight. May we um, firstly ask you if you could take a moment to be part of our menti.com uh, survey just so that we can find out a little bit more about who's with us tonight and what your interest is in dark skies. So to do that, if you could just open your smartphone or uh, another browser window, type in menti.com and the code 75876956. And you can also use that QR code on the screen. And in just a moment now, I will pop the same uh, code into the chat box. So just while everyone's joining, um, we have um, a chat box that I mentioned for comments and for greetings and a questions and answers box, which if we could direct you to put your questions in there, then um, we will get to them uh, and present them to our, our speakers. So Voices for Dark Skies, we have a, um, a very detailed program, as I said, we've um, Betty Maya Foote from the International Dark Sky Association, and she's joining us from Utah. We have Dara Quill of the Roads Management Office, giving us a presentation on public lighting. We have Susan Callahan, a, a divisional ecologist with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. And we have Niall Smith, head of Black Rock Castle Observatory and MTU. And uh, we will follow that up with a panel discussion where we'll be also joined by Professor Brian Espy. Uh, so myself, Georgia Macmillan, I'm uh, based in Mayo. I'm the Mayo Dark Skies Park Development Officer and Bernadette Connolly from Cork Environmental Forum will be your hosts for this evening. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing this for a second and just see if we can switch to that Menti screen and see where everyone is. So just bear with me a second. Let's go back on that. Oops. It's not coming up. Just one second. Under pressure. <laughs> there we go. That's it. Okay. And we're not screen sharing yet either. So just one second. We'll screen share. And we should have our venti. There we are. So now we haven't, maybe you didn't get the code. I don't know if that worked. No, nope. oh, we're not having any success with Menti tonight. Okay, we might leave it for now. And we'll come back to that. There is a menti.com code 75876956. And I'll uh, come back to that later in the evening just to see what your interest in dark skies is and where you are based. Uh, so not to worry, we have lots more to move on with. Um, so I'm, Delighted to, to welcome you all. Um, this is a Dark Sky Ireland event. And just to give you a bit of background, Dark Sky Ireland was originally known as the Irish Light Pollution Campaign. It was founded in the early 2000s by Colm O'Brien and by Albert White. It became a chapter of the International Dark Sky Association in 2003. In 2018, a meeting was held at the Mayo Dark Sky Festival by a group of individuals representing various organisations around the island of Ireland with a common interest to protect Ireland's night skies from light pollution. With kind permission of Albert White, the name became Dark Sky Ireland was adopted to reflect the new network representing dark skies on the whole island of Ireland. We are a group of like-minded individuals representing groups and accredited places. And there are three international dark sky sites on the island. Kerry International Dark Sky Reserve, which was founded in 2014. Mayo International Dark Sky Park in 2016. Ohm Dark Sky Park in 2020. And there are new applications uh, imminently being submitted from Loch Gur, uh, just outside Limerick. So the island of Ireland has also twice hosted the European Symposium for the Protection of the Night Skies in 2009 and also 10 years later in 2019, attracting an international audience on both occasions. As a voluntary group, we regularly receive inquiries from the communities seeking support on light pollution and how to combat it, and also for dark sky accreditation queries. Last week, the Government of Ireland published Our Rural Future, 
a rural development policy for 2021 20, to 2025. And within that, there were three separate references to made to develop a new dark sky strategy with a focus on the opportunities to develop this unique blend of tourism and science for rural communities. The timing is right. The timing is right for us to, to gather together. And the aim for this evening is to explore a variety of light pollution solutions and offer them to interested parties and groups and to advise on the next steps for the journey as a voice for dark skies. We can all speak for the night. So folks, with, with that and on that note, I have a couple of slides just to take you through as an example of a project uh, that a few of us have been working on in Newport in Mayo uh, together with lighting designers. Um, and it's a template that we hope that other regions may uh, be able to adopt or learn from. So it'll just be a quick screen share. Let's hope this works now. This is a project that was funded by the Heritage Council. Um, it's called Newport's uh, Lighting Master Plan. And uh, the goal was to protect the Dark Sky Park uh, just outside of Newport Mayo, uh, to provide sensitive lighting for heritage structures in the town, to collaborate with the local community and the local authority, and to provide a template for best practice lighting. So this picture, although it's not the best astrophotography uh, photo and uh, that's my fault, but um, what it does show though is um, the stars that we can see when we have lights uh, turned down, when we don't floodlight um, structures. So even though there is light on that building, it's not floodlit. The it problem issues we had uh, are in these photos where we have um, uh, earlier uh, sodium lights, which we've transitioned into LEDs and floodlighting. And that's where some of the issues we're going to talk about tonight come, uh, the colour difference, the imbalance of uh, prioritising energy over ecological consequences with lighting. Uh, this is the impact of that light pollution um, uh, with a cloudy sky. So just some other examples of why we needed to put um, together a light pollution uh, management plan, lighting master plan. Uh, this is the heritage bridge in the town and some aerial shots, which admittedly are Quite attractive but at the same time the the light is wasted it's it's not doing what it should be uh, just a quick um, idea of where the the town is in proximity to the dark sky park for about uh, 25 minutes drive from mayo dark sky park up here in the nathans so this project gathered stakeholders together we uh, engaged a, a lighting designers, uh, Roberto Corradini and Marco Palindella, who had visited Newport at the uh, previously mentioned European Symposium and had provided us with outline indications of how we could uh, resolve the, the issues we had. Uh, we've uh, worked with resident groups, with environmental groups, with our local authority, with special interest groups in heritage and astronomy, and of course, with the church and parish. All of uh, dark sky actions have uh, common interests with sustainable development goals. And that's a big part of our plan to highlight that it's not just about energy. There are a number of different factors, good health and well-being, education, uh, sustainable communities, um, uh, biodiversity, and uh, both on land and below water. So we looked at a study area, which is this town center. We provided that to our uh, lighting designers to take note of what we needed to light, what we needed to keep dark, our river, um, our, uh, to highlight our uh, heritage structures, the viaduct and St. Patrick's Church, and to take into account that we have a secondary route going right through the town. So working with uh, Mayo County Council, they already agreed to transition uh, the N59 lights from uh, what were going to be at least 3000 Kelvin, so we're on the, the whiter uh, end of the uh, lighting spectrum to 2700, which means they're dark sky friendly. Um, and we have also asked that any subsequent lights uh, that go in that are LEDs are even lower than that. In terms of the heritage structures, uh, Roberto and uh, Marco provided 
down lighting only for, uh, for heritage structures and also to make use of where we have uh, stained glass windows to make use of lighting from within so that it is an attractive nighttime concept. Another view of the same church. Uh, lighting in surrounding areas and car parks again to be warm and to be downward only. And these are just examples of the fittings because it's a heritage structure it has to be very sensitively fitted and approved by the Heritage Council and our heritage officer and also we wanted to make sure that any lighting that was um, within arches was secreted not shining up into the sky and would also be the minimum light required so that as not to illuminate uh, any aquatic life. That's an example of uh, light fittings on the heritage structure. And this is uh, the original render uh, design that we had, again, just showing subtle lighting in the arches, downward lighting from the church. And if all is successful, then we will see that starry night sky as well as having well lit structures. So the outcomes from having a good lighting plan, and this is where it's transferable, it's an attraction for off-season sustainable business, it reduces waste and sky glow, it's aesthetic, it improves the nighttime social environment for the citizens and residents, it highlights the architectural features, it protects biodiversity and it promotes well-being and reduces that blue-rich light content. So that is the last slide on that. I will close and unshare the screen and um, that's just an introduction to, um, to one example of a lighting master plan and we hope that others may, uh, it may be useful to other groups around the country um, to share with. So on that note um, I think I will hand over to Bernie, um, Bernadette and if you'd like to introduce our first speaker. Okay, so um, good evening everybody and delighted there are so many of you joining us. I'm really here as part of Cork Sky Friendly campaign, so that's Cork Environmental's forum um, role in the Cork Sky Friendly campaign. So I am delighted to welcome Betty Maya Foot to this event um, from across the Atlantic. So Betty Maya is the Director of Engagement in the International Dark Sky Association. She graduated from the University of Utah with a HBS in Environmental and Sustainability Studies. Her dark sky career began with working for Utah State Parks, starting 12 international dark sky park applications across the state. She then worked as the coordinator for the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Co Cooperative and the Consortium for Dark Sky Studies at the University of Utah. Now she is incredibly excited to be one of the team at the International Dark Sky Association as Director of Engagement. And when not on the clock, Betamaya loves to practice night sky photography. Preserving dark skies is her life goal, and she is incredibly excited to continue this journey of saving the stars. So Betamaya's title talk is Global Dark Sky Advocacy, how to connect the IDA's Global Dark Sky Network. So over to you, Betamaya. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette, and uh, thank you, Georgia, as well. Congratulations on um, all of the amazing work you guys have done in your community and on pulling together such an incredible week of events for Dark Sky Week. So yeah, happy Dark Sky Week, everybody. Thanks for participating. Um, I'm just gonna talk briefly today about the International Dark Sky Association and how you can join and kind of connect with the work that not that we're doing, but that everyone is doing um, around the world. So I'll just share a brief presentation here. Uh, all right. Okay, okay. So I just want to start off by thanking everybody for being here as well. Um, let me turn off my video so I don't get distracted by myself. Um, yeah, just thank you everyone for being here. Um, I think it's easy to kind of overlook the courage that it takes to even attend these type of events and to think about tackling such a large global problem as light pollution. And it really does take a lot of courage and bravery um, to, to want to join the fight and to be a pioneer for dark sky preservation 
and to take on such a challenging global topic. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, and it's really an honor to be invited here today. Um, I'll just briefly share our mission at the IDA basically is to protect the night from light pollution. Um, and we do this by promoting responsible use of outdoor lighting. So we're a global nonprofit that is headquartered in Tucson, Arizona, um, and we've been around for about 30 years now. Um, but we're a really small staff of seven people currently. Uh, so if it takes us a while ever to get back to your emails, it's because um, <laughs> there's just a, a lot of people out there and not that many of us, but we, we always do our best and um, really it's our job to support you on the ground and advocates all around the world. It's you who are making the difference and we're just kind of there as the connectors and trying to provide as many resources as possible. But the work on the ground is done by incredible volunteers like Georgia and everyone else here who is attending today. Something I just always like to say, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, a lot of people get turned off by dark sky advocacy because they think we're just trying to turn all the lights off, um, which I'm not opposed to, but our real value at IDA is to promote responsible use of outdoor lighting because there is a need for light at night in some cases. And so we want to make it easier for you to do this in a way that still lets you see the beautiful night sky above. So kind of a good way to say this is just we're dark sky, not dark ground. Um, and we're not trying to turn off all the lights. Our real goal is to change people's relationship with the night sky and with lighting so that in time they come to understand that they do not need to use quite as much of it and that it can be done in a responsible way. So this is really cool too. I think that uh, also some of the misconceptions people can think of in terms of dark skies is that it has, it's only a rural issue. And if you can't see the Milky Way, why bother? But I lived in Tucson, Arizona, and we recently went through a light conversion where we uh, converted our lights to LEDs that can be done well. Um, it's definitely a double-edged sword, but they were um, warm LEDs that are actually dimmed at night. And we were able to study it and found that through our conversion, we reduced the blue light emissions by 34% with an overall lumen reduction of 63% and save the city of Tucson $2.1 million a year in annual energy savings. Um, and also really helped the residents living in Tucson be able to sleep well and not have lights coming into their window and to be able to connect to the natural light cycles of the moon and the stars. And I could notice when I was living there, you know, when it was a full moon, when it was a new moon and just being able to connect with those natural rhythms, even in a large city, I think is something that is, um, is really great about the dark sky movement. And it's not just for rural areas, it has benefits for everyone and everyone can participate. So I'll just talk briefly about some of the programs that we have at IDA. Um, our flagship one really being our International Dark Sky Places program. Um, and Georgia kind of touched on the beautiful dark sky parks that are in Ireland. Uh, we just hit our 100th dark sky park, which is really exciting. Uh, we're up to 103 now in the last week. Um, and we have 178 dark sky places in total across the world. Um, and these are really amazing places that people can go and visit and experience not only a dark sky, but experience what dark sky friendly lighting looks like and feels like, um, and also can participate in educational activities and events about the night sky. So uh, definitely check it out. One of the coolest, newest designations we have is an urban night sky place. And these are places that don't necessarily have dark skies. They may be in cities, so they may not be able to see the Milky Way. Uh, but you can go there and experience dark sky friendly lighting and learn about outreach programs and events that are happening. Um, we only have two urban night sky places so far around the world. So we'd love to see more applications for this new designation as well. Uh, we have a lighting program which certifies fixtures that are dark sky friendly. We're working on building our international uh, repertoire i guess a lot of them are, are us based right now but you, it's an online database you can search uh, by different lighting types to to see what kind of lighting you need and they're all ida approved 
Uh, we also provide lighting guidance. We just released updated lighting recommendations uh, that are available on our website in partnership with the International um, Illumination, Illumination Engineering Society. And um, yeah, there's some new language in there about Kelvin and color temperature. And it's definitely worth taking a look at and hopefully can help you advocate for updating light, updated lighting practices in your own communities. We also have a policy program that provides model lighting policies and support for updating your lighting ordinances or other lighting policies in your community. Um, and then the program I really wanna to talk to you all about today is our advocacy program. Um, and I'm hoping that we can all, we can connect you all to it. And that's kind of, um, my bag here with IDA is working to connect all of our volunteers and advocates around the world. So some of the resources we provide, uh, we'll ship brochures to you for free around the world if you're an IDA member, so that's cool. Um, if you don't, if you're not able to afford IDA membership, we do offer a membership scholarship as well. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can just email me. Um, my email will be on the last slide. Uh, we also have little postcards that we can send out. We have model PowerPoints that you can use for city presentations or group presentations. We have a lot of uh, great videos online, kind of a lot like this from what Georgia has put together here, but different presenters from around the world. And all of those are on our YouTube channel as well. Um, and we also have many resources linked in Slack, which is the program that we use to connect the disparate group of global advocates around the world. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Also just check out our blog. I don't think enough people read our blog, but we like have so many articles on our website that we regularly update our blog. Um, our website's a little 90s style, so apologies for that. We're also working on updating it, but uh, definitely keep in touch with us, read our blog. A lot of these are also shared in our newsletter as well. Uh, and this really, just again, to make the point, this is a movement where we need everybody. This light pollution doesn't respect boundaries and it's growing at an incredible rate around the world. Uh, just seeing this image, it's not hard to imagine a future where in a lot of places there is no natural darkness remaining at all. Um, but I don't think we're fighting a losing battle. I think I've seen interest grow just in the past few years that I've been working at IDA, the amount of people reaching out and from all different places around the world is incredible. And uh, it's what keeps me going every day is just the hope and passion that I feel and see from people in all corners of the globe. Um, so I just think that, that it's definitely not an easy challenge, but people are stepping up to the plate and they're coming from all around the world, which is exactly what we need. So we hope all of you will join us as well. Slack, this is what we use to kind of connect everybody. It's a little bit hard to get used to if you're not used to it already, but I know a lot of places like Slack is just becoming second nature in our new virtual world. Um, I will send a link, I think I have it right now in the chat here um, and please join Slack. Uh, this is just a, a Google form to submit your email so that I can add you to Slack and I'll also invite you to the Advocates Monthly Meetings, which we'll talk about. Um, but it's a really fun way and place to find dark sky friends. Uh, it's easy to feel alone in the battle against light pollution. And this is kind of our effort to connect everyone and also create a space where we can share resources like Georgia's lighting management plan so that people around the world can benefit from all of the work that's already been done and not necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and then another fun thing we do is host advocates monthly meetings, which are just on a different random subject about dark skies every month. Um, and it's really fun. We have a presentation and then question and answers and usually some time to break into gr breakout groups and kind of just chat with different dark sky people around the world. Um, so if you put your email into that form, you'll also be added to the invitations to join these Advocates Monthly meetings as well, which I found to be very, very fun and enjoyable. 
Uh, please follow us on social media. I hope you've seen Dark Sky Week has really been trending. Uh, we have a lot of channels, Facebook, Insta, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, we're working on a TikTok. If anyone wants to like help us with the TikTok for IDA, please reach out to me. Um, I'd love to see some like dances about light pollution, um, but definitely give us a follow. It's a quick and easy way to support us. And I'll just end with this quote from Ruskin Hartley, which is kind of my favorite um, thing about light pollution is that it's so easily removed from the environment, right? It's the only type of pollution that we can solve at the speed of light. Once you shield a light, once you turn off a light, that pollution is immediately gone and removed from the environment. And I love instant gratification. So it's really great to um, actually be able to implement solutions and directly see the results of your work. Um, so yeah, thank you. This is my email here, bettymaya at darksky.org. Um, please reach out to me with any questions. Please fill out that form that I popped into the chat if you're interested in being added to Slack as well as added to our Advocates Monthly Meetings invitations and receiving the Advocates Newsletter uh, with kind of IDA insider info. And then if you wanna follow my Instagram for night sky photos, it's bettymaya.foot. And I will stop sharing here. I you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, um, Betty Maya. That was great. Sorry for that um, momentary pause. I couldn't unmute myself. So I think um, Georgia just wants to come in before Dara because she has the Minty, um, I suppose the Minty consultation results there to share. Do, do you have that to share, Georgia? So I guess it's just capturing um, where people are from and what people's interest is. Yep, so we've uh, residents, we've more residents, I think, uh, Astronomy Club there, Oregon. Uh, welcome. Uh, mainly local residents, astronomers, we've got lighting manufacturers, bio, those interested in biodiversity. So there is a good widespread. So thank you for taking part in that. That's good to know. Um, yeah, that's great to know. And also thank you, um, just to remind people to put any questions for the speakers in the Q&A. And we'll move on now to um, Dara Quill, but just you know, to thank Betty Maya again, advocacy is so important. And I also thought that quote was really, really good. You know, we always say in Cork Sky Friendly Campaign, it's the easiest pollution to address. So it's um, it's really good to link in. And the collaborations across the globe, I think, are really important. So just to say that um, we're delighted to be joined by Dara Quill. Dara is um, in the Roads Maintenance Office. And he's a local authority engineer who is leading a shared service team whose role was to develop a business case which identified options for local authorities to achieve energy saving targets while also meeting other local authority public lighting service efficiency objectives. He subsequently led the RMO team to project manage and coordinate the sector into delivering the PLEAP, which stands for Public Lighting Energy Efficiency Project, into regionalized contracts. He has 30 years experience working for engineering consultants, delivering a wide range of transport infrastructure projects, in particular relating to bridge structures. So that's interesting because I saw a few comments coming in about the bridge in Mayo in Newport. Um, from 2007 to 2016, he was the Transport Infrastructure Ireland Regional Bridge Manager for the Southwest region. So Dara's talk is the National Public Lighting Energy Efficiency Project and he will give a background as to how local authorities are maximizing energy efficiency of public lighting. So over to you, Dara. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, can you? Yeah. And uh, can you see the presentation? Just want to check. Not yet, Dara, no. Has it not up yet now? Bear with me one second. Sometimes I forget to. It just takes a minute, maybe. Yeah, it's up now, Dara, just to make it full screen. Okay. That's okay. perfect. 
Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, as mentioned, uh, I work for the Road Management Office, um, which is a shared service working on behalf of um, all local authorities, um, where we were um, effectively established a couple of years ago to to look at public lighting um, from the local authorities' perspective um, against uh, various different objectives. Uh, one being primarily being the the, the energy um, saving agenda that 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 was coming to the fore at, uh, at that time. <clears throat> so in relation to that, um, here's a, a picture of um, Ireland with the with the the um, uh, public lighting public lights on. Uh, we have in the uh, Republic of Ireland 490,000 uh, public lights, uh, consuming 58,000 kilowatts um, when all on. Uh, that's um, consuming uh, 244 gigawatt hours uh, per annum. Um, and uh, we've identified that if we can um, achieve uh, at least 50% uh, energy savings by conversion over to LEDs, that we can save 122 gigawatt hours uh, per annum. In terms of the um, uh, public lights in, in, in Ireland, uh, you can see here a, a picture of uh, Ireland with the SANS, uh, uh, low pressure sodium and, uh, and SOX, high, uh, sorry, low pressure, sodium, low pressure sodium as the SOX uh, represented here in pink, as uh, the high pressure sodium represented in uh, cyan, and then the um, blue lights indicating where lights have been converted over to um, um, LED. So you can see a kind of a pattern there tr tr throughout Ireland. Uh, in terms of energy savings and the percentage um, conversion over to LEDs, uh, you can see here that some local authorities are a little bit more proactive than others, uh, with uh, Monaghan uh, uh, um, conversion over to LEDs at a, at a very high percentage, and then certain local authorities, you know, uh, achieving energies uh, are LED conversions of the order of uh, 30 30 percent, um, which means that another six, uh, another uh, seventy percent uh, needs to be achieved to 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 maximise the energy savings. In terms of the local authority objectives, um, <clears throat> uh, one of the one of the driving uh, forces behind the the, the 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 project has been uh, the uh, climate action objectives for local authorities to achieve uh, thirty percent energy savings uh, by two thousand and twenty, which was last year. Um, in in tandem with that, and coming down the line, is uh, need to um, achieve energy savings. Um, uh, to meet uh, 2030 targets. So you can see here, this kind of represents uh, that uh, while the um, conversion to LEDs wouldn't necessarily uh, meet the full 2030 objectives, it takes local authorities a significant way there towards um, meeting that milestone. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, the Road Management Office is a shared service um, working on behalf of local authorities. Um, it's not to be confused, we're not a, a, a national agency. We don't have authority over local authorities. We effectively uh, carry out work on behalf of local authorities. And in doing so, we're directed to by a road management board, which is made up of representatives from, from senior management um, of local authorities across the sector. Uh, so the public lighting unit was set up in 2017, primarily um, to 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 develop a business case um, for 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 the um, LEDs, but also in terms of uh, the the uh, best approach for for local authorities and managing the public lighting going forward. <clears throat> and in doing so, we're made up of uh, three people: myself, uh, Brian Ahern, and Brian Burke. And um, so we've kind of taken up different roles. I'm kind of more looking after the types of contracts. Uh, Brian O'Hearn's been helping with the uh, software development and Brian Burke was helping in terms of the specification development and also in terms of um, engagement with the ESB um, networks, which is a, a major stakeholder for this type of project. Um, in terms of the approach then, uh, what was recommended in the business case is that we would take uh, three large um, um, regionalized contracts in the in the, in, the, in the country, the southwest, the eastern, uh, and the northwest. Uh, that would be led by a lead authority in within each of the regions. In the southwest, it's Cork. In the eastern region, it's Kilkenny. And in the uh, 
the, the Northwest region, it's, it's Mayo County Council. Um, the idea was to maximize um, um, uh, economies of scale uh, and also to achieve um, um, a consistency in, in terms of the approach, in terms of our types of contracts, and that we'd have an overall governance and management of that. <clears throat> Some local authorities have chosen um, to manage the LED um, projects or the energy efficiency um, of public lighting themselves, uh, mainly to relating to res their own resources. Um, and so you'd see that the, in that in this regard, the, the, the urban areas, the Dublin local authorities and Cork and Galway cities have, um, have chosen not to participate as, as a regional contract uh, together with uh, Longford County Council and uh, Leach County Council who have dedicated resources within those local authorities to um, achieve that um, their, their, their objectives. So in that regard, we have 20, 21 local authorities participating in, in, in the project. Uh, which will involve the retrofitting of 250,000 public lights uh, uh, of approximately 80,000 per, 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 per region. Uh, um, so, yeah. The types of contract then that we've um, settled on is an NEC form of contract, um, which is a um, design build um, 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 contract. It's, it's not. Um, uh, government form of contract in that uh, it recognizes that we are trying to retrofit around the existing infrastructure. So there's um, a degree of um, risk that the can't, that can't be transferred to the uh, private sector. So that will need to be proactively managed throughout the process. Uh, we've set a, a minimum energy sa saving targets of 55% within the contract documents. Uh, there's an incentive, an incentive for the contractor to um, um, overachieve energy safe uh, efficiency by 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 uh, providing a bonus for them. Um, um, in that regard as well, the if three regional contracts um, not going in parallel but going in tandem, so lessons learned can be derived as the projects and the regions are are are, are progressed. So in that regard, the southwest region has gone to tender. The tenders have been um, have have been returned. Um, and they're currently undergoing a tender evaluation. Um, in the meantime, the uh, other two regions, the Eastern and the Northwest region are preparing contract documents uh, to move forward with that. So we're hoping to have a contractor appointed this summer uh, for the Southwest region um, uh, in around the July of 2021. Um, in summary, then the, the, the contracts, the three regionalized contracts, are, in terms of capital spend, are, are, are of the order of 50 million per region. Uh, so that's a total capital expenditure of 150 million. Uh, once once um, the project is completed over the 20 year horizon, there should be savings to local authorities of 200 million in terms of energy savings and uh, maintenance cost savings as well. Uh, it would also save approximately uh, 2,500 tons of CO2 per year and save uh, 72,000 um, uh, uh, megawatts per hour, per, uh, megawatt hours per annum um, going forward as well. Um, in terms of the the the, the lantern specification, um, a lot of discussions about. Um, the, 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 the spec specification of lanterns and uh, managing um, and the public or public lighting by considering the possibility of central management system. Uh, that wasn't um, decided, that wasn't um, um, specified um, um, or was, but however, the, 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 the lanterns were um, um, specified to ensure that the they were future proof for, for future technologies into the future. So what we're trying to do is get a one size fit all. Uh, the, the, the lantern specification all, all, um, um, uh, set out to be, um, uh, to, to allow for future technologies and flexibility into the future. Um, color temperature obviously is a, was a big issue and in that regard uh, and in terms of the lantern specification a technical working group made up of representatives from the local authority sector were um, was established to help um, shape and inform the, the the development of the um, specification um, I think in more recent times the local authorities were um, I suppose 
specifying color temperatures in around the 4000 Kelvin mark. Uh, some engagement with, with, with the likes of dark sky um, was encouraging us to um, warmer lights. So the, 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 the color temperature um, has been specified primarily around the, the, the 3000 Kelvin mark uh, for this project um, going forward. Uh, trimming and dimming. Um, one of the other areas that we want to um, encourage maximize energy savings was to um, agree with the ESB networks a, a, a series of uh, trimming and dimming profiles for the lanterns that's built into the specification for the for the lanterns for for various different scenarios. So thereby achieving um, maximum um, energy savings that we. Um, can, can possibly get. What I might add is, um, what I might add is, bear with me. What I might add is that the um, um, the 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 ESB in terms of the um, public lighting is 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 unmetered. So this is not measured uh, on an ongoing basis. It's measured on on uh, our charge to local authorities on the basis of burn hours um, uh, per annum. Uh, for the vast majority of, of public lightings. So that's why we needed to get uh, these various different profiles agreed uh, with ESB networks. Um, in order to facilitate the, the, um, the, 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 the project, we also needed to develop um, some software so that the information could be captured as the works are progressing. So in that regard, uh, a, 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 an extension of existing asset management software called MapRoad was expanded to capture the um, public lighting um, um, inventory data that was going to be found on underground, but also in terms of recording uh, the the types of lanterns and the condition of the asset um, uh, going forward as 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 part of the um, um, as part of the 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 the, the project. So in that regard, a, 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 an app was was also for um, was developed as well to to for use uh, with a with a smartphone so that the contractor can capture information as he's as he's um, uh, progressing the works. Um, so that the information in relation to uh, the progress of the project is, is, is captured on, a, on live on an ongoing basis. Um, also in terms of, um, in terms of assistance, uh, we, um, the European Investment Bank provided support by way of um, funding towards the, the sector to, in order to help develop the contract documents to go to tender. Um, and they are providing assistance of 1.9 million, which is to cover the cost of consultancy costs, um, development of a, a, a website, um, and the cost of staffing the road management office for a period of time. And also in terms of um, um, provide, provision of funding to local authorities to ensure that their data sets um, are, are, are fit for purpose and, and capture the information that needed to be included as part of the contract documents. Likewise, the, uh, the, the Irish government um, um, had a competition for the Climate Action Fund in uh, 2018, uh, looking to, the, um, uh, to, 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 to industry and to the uh, public sector to, for, for various different projects that needed or, or um, would, uh, would benefit from, from financial assistance and helping uh, moving projects forward. So in that regard, the, 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 the sector um, achieved a, um, would be receiving a, 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 a grant assistance of 17.5 million um, towards the, the overall project of which I mentioned is, is of the order of 150 million. And that's in, is, 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 is where we are. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dara. Um, that was great. And we're glad that the intervention, I suppose, in 2019, just a conversation, because I suppose a lot of advocacy is just conversation, that that helps to influence and has helped to influence, I suppose, the Kelvin um, of 2300, the maximum. Um, so um, there's a few questions coming in there, which will be good, but we'll take all the questions at the end. So we'll move on now to Susan Callahan. And um, Susan works as divisional ecologist with the National Parks and Wildlife Service um, with the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. 
She has worked with MPWS in the roles of education officer, conservation ranger, district conservation officer, and has been the divisional ecologist in the Western Division since 2019. She's been based in the Mayo area for the past 20 years and has been involved in the management of Wild Neff and Valley Cry National Park and the establishment of Mayo Dark Sky Park. Her current role as divisional ecologist focuses primarily on eco ecological assessment and providing advice on the implications of works such as infrastructure development, capital projects and farm activities on nature conservation from landscape to farm level, including implications for European designated sites and protected species. And the title of Susan's talk is National Guidance on Lighting for Ecologically Sensitive Area. So thank you very much, Susan, and over to you. Thanks, Bernadette. Um, yeah, I'm going to probably stop my video anyway, uh, just due to bandwidth, and I will try and share my screen now, hopefully. Can you see that? Yep, looks good. See. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, my name is Sue Callahan. I work with uh, the National Parks and Wildlife Service, which we're currently part of the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. Um, we've gone from many different departments um, over the years, but this is where we currently reside. Um, I, uh, I'm a native of Dublin, but I live in, in Mayo and have been here for the past uh, 25 years and have been working with MPWS probably in around that time as well and moved to Mayo as, as, as a rain uh, to take up the role as, as conservation ranger. Uh, I thought, well, firstly, uh, I just want to commend uh, Dark Sky, uh, Ireland and Georgia and everybody on the uh, on the, the amount of effort and the fantastic week that's that's been presented. And I just have to say I'm privileged uh, to have been asked to be here this evening as a, as a voice of Dark Skies. I, I often say that I'm, I'm just on the coattails of people, um, as, especially Georgia and um, uh, I, I suppose <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure where my role is, but um, in terms of promoting dark skies, but I'll try this evening just to present uh, where, where I suppose promotion of dark sky fits within national policy. Um, certainly uh, it's the community groups that are, are really driving dark skies and the, the promotion of dark skies in Ireland. And what I'd like to do this evening is just maybe show where, where national policy and international policy fits within that. Um, and I come at it from a, a top-down approach, whereas uh, the community and grassroots are coming from a bottom-up approach. So there is importance for, for, for those two to meet and uh, to meet effectively. So just, uh, I uh, currently now I'm working within uh, the what we call the Ecological Assessment Unit uh, in National Parks. There's various different groups of uh, units and sections within MPWS. Um, we have responsibility um, specifically for national parks and uh, nature reserves and the management of those sites um, for, for managing and monitoring special areas of conservation and special protection areas um, for research, uh, for education. Um, and also then within this unit, there's, there's 10 of us working, um, eight divisional uh, e ecologists. Um, currently, there's only myself in the West, but... Um, there are two positions here and we uh, I suppose I suppose our role is in in EAU as we call it is to um, give statutory response uh, with regards to nature conservation concerns for for developments and activities so it's governmental response um, it's looking at the implications of plans and projects with regards to nature conservation at the pre-planning stage of a development so talking with developers talking with uh, consultants about a project and and what's required and then uh, reviewing ecological assessments of these things, uh, these projects. Um, we also look at site specific and uh, species conservation management. Um, and we also deal with restoration of sites where there's been damage to a site or especially protected site and where restoration is required. So we would set out those requirements. Um, our unit is also uh, developing guidance. 
Um, we are a small unit and uh, our, our, unfortunately, guidance uh, hasn't been developed as much as it should be, um, especially in the past few years, uh, up, up till only two or three years ago, there was only four divisional ecologists. Our numbers have doubled in recent years. So that's a positive and, and I suppose the push and, and concerns with regards to biodiversity crisis that we're currently in and climate change crisis has pushed and hopefully more staff will be coming into MPWS and, and these things can develop further and guidance can develop further. But at the moment there is uh, guidance being put together on appropriate assessment, which is related to European designations and what's called the Habitats Directive, and also related to that strictly protected species. So these are species that are listed under what's called the Annex 4 of the Habitats Directive. And I suppose in terms of dark skies, they relate specifically to bats and also to otters. Um, so <clears throat> within those, I suppose, that framework, um, there's also the importance of the National Biodiversity Action Plan, which is, um, it looks out beyond the designations, the national designations that we have, and looks at, at our biodiversity as, um, as a, not necessarily a resource, but as our heritage, as our natural heritage. And it is a plan, uh, it's, it's, well, the, the current Biodiversity Action Plan is coming to an end this year and a new one now will be, be rolled out in, in the not too distant future. Um, but it sets out government objectives and government policy with respect to biodiversity. And from that then um, various programs, projects and, and sources of funding can come from that and stem from that. These are the primary objectives, seven objectives. And what we push in EAU is and, and, and to all government departments is number one, especially, which is mainstreaming biodiversity into all aspects of decision making across all government sectors. So that's really, really important. And it's it's a, a drum that we are banging consistently now um, that biodiversity has to be front and center in all decision making, just as much as issues such as health and safety are. It needs to be part of that overall consideration. Um, then there's all the other objectives and there's various actions that stem from that, uh, increasing awareness and appreciation of biodiversities and ecosystems, conser conserve and restore biodiversity. So they're all there. And I would encourage people to, to, to look at the, the National Biodiversity Action Plan. It's very, very important. Um, then also with regards to um, general key ecological concepts and commitments, of our, our government um, and local authorities and public authorities. So as Dara mentioned, the European Green Deal and, and we have to move towards carbon neutrality um, by 2050. So all our infrastructural developments have to have that within their, 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 their I suppose, plan development um, and project development at this stage. It's very important. Um, so even within that, there'll be carbon offsetting and whether that be, um, I don't know, re-wetting uh, blanket bog or whatever it may be. So this is an important thing. And, and, and dark skies uh, and light pollutions are, are major considerations within this. Then there's also the European Biodiversity Strategy 2030. So at the moment, um, a large part of the, the or, uh, I suppose, a key element of the National Biodiversity Plan is no net loss of biodiversity, but that's changing. And it has in the UK where it's now net biodiversity gain. So that's a, it's new terminology that is coming in. <clears throat> and it, the idea then being that we, for projects and plans and infrastructural developments, there should be a biodiversity gain as a consequence, not a loss in any shape or form, um, not a no net loss, not a equal, there should be a gain. So um, this again, reflecting the, the biodiversity crisis that we're currently um, in and the sixth extinction, as, as we would say. So that is something that we're moving towards now and we're trying to, to uh, get our heads around in, in nationally is the concept of biodiversity gain. And then there's also um, this other element, which has been, I suppose, bread and butter as well of, of National Parks and Wildlife Service since uh, since um, 1998, really, uh, with the Habitats and Birds Directive. So that's with reference to what's called SACs and 
special protection areas, SPAs. So that's where the requirements for appropriate assessment come in. And they're quite, they're very strong. It's strong legislation because the requirements of AA is that there should be these sites are protected, they're legally protected, and there cannot be any way of, of, of damaging this site, that there is no nuance, there is no um, um, give or take here, there just cannot be any uh, impact on the integrity of these sites. And we are legally bound to ensure that. And as a consequence, there's been Euro various European court judgments um, on the interpretation of this element of it, which is called Article 663. Also, there's general guidance that we work at and look at and are guided by, which includes, say, for instance, um, the IFI, the Irish Fish Fisheries, um, the Inland Fisheries, sorry. So they've done a, a new um, guidance document in terms of urban environment and water courses. And again, lighting is important here. For instance, also public lighting recommendations, which is important for us. And that's what we recommend in, in a lot of our, um, uh, our, our written correspondence now as well. So these things inform good decision making for biodiversity in relation to development are, and are underpin, underpinning conservation management um, in Ireland. So um, I suppose in terms of ecological light pollution, so there is various forms of light pollution, but ecological light pollution is what, what we focus on. And it's important to understand that animals perceive light differently to humans. So when we go out at night, we look at the world in, in one way and lighting is, is specific to allow us to see, I suppose, better at night, but it affects animals in very, in, in, in very different ways, um, especially the, the blue light, but even red light can attract and interfere with um, birds, for instance, in, in the way they make migration and their internal navigational process. So um, I suppose some of, just to go through some of those impacts, there's deaths um, due to direct collision on tall lighted structures. I mean, in the past, that would have been with, with lighthouses, for instance, and there is an amazing um, wealth of information on lighthouses and, and, the, and the birds that they would have recorded uh, as a consequence at, these, at, at the lighthouses. And that was a great way of recording what birds were, were off our Irish coasts. Um, but in recent years, of course, this is as, um, I suppose flipped then to these large tall buildings, skys not necessarily skyscrapers, but just tall buildings, especially in cityscapes. And that's something that's becoming, um, especially with the push now for compact growth in Ireland, um, and that's part of the national planning framework. Um, so we're going to have more of these tall lighted structures in our in our cities and in our towns. And so there is um, a, there is a consequence of that. You're having lighted um, buildings, and and birds are more likely to be pulled to towards those, those and you'll have direct collision. Um, <clears throat> then there's the, the kind of nationally, internationally examples of, of light pollution, such as turtle hatchlings being disorientated at beaches and, and going the wrong way, going up towards the nightclub rather than <laughs> going towards the, the sea. Um, so that's kind of a well-known uh, uh, light pollution impact. Um, but there are more subtle and complex influences of, of artificial light at night um, on the bee, on predator and prey relationships. So there's the the, the moth to the flame, then the, the bats then um, and they feed and it interferes with the predator prey relationships that, that occur um, and it creates imbalance. Um, fish and zooplankton lighting um, pulls a lot of zooplankton up to the top of the, the water column and will alter that, again, predator-prey uh, relationship and interrelationship. Also with fish, they get pulled to, to sites where there's more lights and that'll pull seals to, to an area where those, those fish are. So it's very complicated and there's all sorts of um, um, influences and impacts as a consequence. And I'm not going to go into detail on those uh, this evening displacement of species. Uh, this is just an example down in Galway. Um, so this is a, a Galway Bay SAC and special protection area. So this has all been lighted um, uh, due to, to, to lighting along the promenade there. So this would be all within a designated site. And this kind of lighting has now, um, as a consequence, it, it, this would have been an important site for, for roosting birds. Otters would have used it. So there, as a consequence of that, this, this may 
then uh, result in displacement of these species, these species not using these areas. And because they're being lit, they're facilitating more human use in these areas, which is also exacerbating this displacement and disturbance effect. And they also cause ecological traps and barriers. So this is one of the um, those bollards. Um, so I, I, I just had seen this picture up actually. Um, and I think this is in DCU. So these, these, this was on a number of bollards within the, the, the campus. So it had pulled, I don't, don't know whether they were f some type of fly or wasp or bee had been pulled in and they it, it, it essentially become a death trap for them. Um, and then the other examples, for instance, um, such as uh, in Newport, but this is another church. So churches are often um, can be, be roosts for, for, for certain types of bats, particularly brown long-eared bats. Um, and, and bats, when they come out of their roost, they kind of light test when they go out. And if the lighting, the light has to be at a certain, um, certain level, low level before they go out. And so if that roost is then being lit up, they will abandon the roost. So that's a direct response, uh, again, to, to, to lighting. Um, one specific example as well, um, in Ireland, we have uh, the lesser horseshoe bat. It's quite a, uh, it's, it's a highly protected bat species in Ireland, and we have designated special areas of conservation for them. Um, and their range is de decreasing. Their numbers are steady, but their range is just decreasing. Um, and, and becoming um, their populations are becoming isolated. So the populations in Cork and Kerry are becoming isolated from those populations in, in Galway. And it's, it's understood that the lighting from um, is creating a barrier effect, a barrier to the movement of, of, of these bats. And that may have then as a consequence genetic uh, implications in terms of, of the species. So as you can see, it's quite nuanced and, um, and there's direct and indirect impacts. So then in terms of, of guidance in Ireland and, and where do you go to look um, as an ecologist and, and somebody who's writing responses, I often go looking for, for, for guidance on these things and I'm always on a, a very steep learning curve. Um, I'm certainly no expert. Um, and there are some very useful guidance documents, but a lot of them do tend to focus on, especially in the European context, on bats. Um, this is a great uh, document, though, um, which was done with the um, International Lighting Professional, the ILP, and the Bat Conservation Trust in the UK. So this was a good document from 2018. Um, then there's also Eurobats, uh, uh, which is another useful document. Then the, the fantastic work that Dark Sky Ireland have done. So there's the Dark Sky Ireland policy, and also then the best practice in, in public lighting that have 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 been have been written, which are really useful and very good again for for us to reference. Um, and then other guidance notes that have been put together by the ILP. Um, this is a useful document um, in terms of obtrusive light. It's obtrusive to humans, but it's also um, uh, reflects there also in terms of light pollution, ecological light pollution. Transport Infrastructure Ireland have also done um, uh, uh, design standards in terms of, of road lighting as well. Um, but, but in an Irish context, it is uh, limited. Um, so there's also the, the pollinator friendly management transport corridors, which is part of the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. And there's a, a small section on that on lighting, but not a huge section. And the same with the TII publications. It's really useful that these are being done, but they, um, we need to, to expand the guidance. I think it's really important. Um, and then there's also the uh, European Green Public Procurement Criteria, which is a, a recent document, well, 2018. So again, there's there's mention of it here as well. So there are a, a number of documents that I've been going to and looking at and reading and, and trying to pull it all together. But um, it's, it's certainly national guidance is needed. And I suppose the purpose of my presentation today was not to give answers. It's probably more to, to shine a light on, on where we need to improve uh, as Ireland Inc, so to speak. Um, especially say the TII guidance, um, it does have environmental zones, but those environmental zones are based on UK criteria. They're not based on Irish uh, national designations or even the European designations. So further development is certainly required with regard to this, which would include Natura sites, 
these are the SACs and SPAs, but then not necessarily just those, also wetland habitats, river habitats, which are so important for as ecological corridors for species, um, for our bats and for our wet, um, aquatic species. Um, so, you know, they need to be protected not only for their water quality, but also for uh, in terms of, of the habitats that riper, what we call riparian habitat, the vegetation along them. They ha that has to be protected because if it's lit at night, it won't be utilized. It's very important for us to protect these ecological corridors. This is just to show the environmental zoning that, that is in the TII guidance. It's great that it's there, but it E1 includes national parks and areas of outstanding natural beauty, that, which are national parks are in the Irish context, but the areas of outstanding natural beauty aren't. Um, also, the ILP guidance has uh, uh, guidance on undertaking uh, environmental lighting impact assessments, and this needs to be done more, I think, um, and we need to pull this in more within um, the concept of environmental impact assessments or ecological impact assessments, which are a kind of a, a smaller version of an EIA, which, which, which are often, which can be used to assess impacts on biodiversity. And, and I suppose these are the, the, the bigger issues, but it should be, and it has been touched upon, upon I suppose the importance of best practice, the importance of policy um, and mitigation should be routine for all developments rather than just limited to, to sites where there's sensitive species. So just best practice should be um, uh, in place all the time. Again, back to just as health and safety best practice should be applied to all developments. And then other resources, there's international guidance. Uh, this is uh, in Toronto. So these are these are these are beginning to become more and more um, relevant to us. Uh, this is bird friendly development guidance um, for Toronto. Toronto is on a, a major mig a migratory route for, for birds. So there is um, uh, a lot of uh, bird, direct bird collisions with um, these tall lit buildings. Uh, the Australian government have, have done a really useful document um, recently, uh, which is National Light Pollution Guidelines for Wildlife. And I would love to see something similar done here in Ireland. Um, so that would be something, I suppose, a vision that I would have was working towards something like this. Um, then also scientific papers, which you can get completely bogged down in. And I, I, I do get a little bit lost and bamboozled sometimes. Um, and then advice notes, which again are really useful. This is one that was done by uh, Natural Scotland with regards to uh, wind turbines and aviation lighting. Uh, aviation lighting can be can be of red light and that attracts uh, some some species of birds so it increases then collision risk to to wind turbines so just to find finally i suppose to to add to the questions really what's needed and i'm suppose i'm just throwing out some suggestions uh, <clears throat> So back to the environmental zones, we need to have environmental zones in, in, in national policy and guidance um, that reflect uh, an Irish scenario. Um, we have to remember, I mean, even a lot of our, 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 our main cities, uh, Galway, Dublin, they have SACs and SPAs right on their coast and within those cities. And that is a wonderful thing that we have. And we're, we're very lucky in Ireland to have these incredibly biodiverse sites and, and designations um, and that are within our cityscapes but as a consequence then we need to treat them um, accordingly with regards to, to, to protection. Um, and these advice, uh, we should also put together advice notes um, which would be made available for councils and for public authorities where grants say for instance are made available and that would be with respect say these again examples from uh, Department of Agriculture say for agricultural sheds or National Roads Authority with regards to July, the July stimulus package say um, you know for, for, for improving um, recreational transport, greenways, uh, lighting projects, all sorts of things. There's all sorts of areas where we can we can improve upon. Um, and as I said already, more use of lighting impact assessments, especially with regards to greenways and blueways, which are, it's brilliant that these um, infrastructural projects are happening. 
um, and they are a response to our carbon, our, our green commitments, but they also have to be, um, uh, they have to <laughs> protect, often these green ways and blue ways are insights that are, are, are ecologically the most sensitive. Um, a lot, especially the, the along uh, canals and river sites. So it's really important that any lighting on these areas um, include mitigation. Uh, and once those that mitigation is set out in any kind of report, it needs to be monitored. So, and it needs to be reported and it needs to be audited. It's very, very important. So you can have all the bells and whistles in your lighting management plan, but when it comes to the practice and the implicate application of it, it doesn't happen. So what's written doesn't get put into practice. So it's imperative that lighting management plans are, are monitored, um, they're uh, put into place and that they are reported on and that there's quality assurance in terms of that lighting design and the installation and there is an audit of it. Also, more research is needed. Um, light pollution is, is probably one of the, the final um, well, I'm sure there's plenty, plenty more, but um, certainly there. It's only in the past ten years I'm finding that there the papers are, are becoming more prevalent with regards to impacts on uh, ecological light pollution. And then I suppose back to to where we started the continued growth of community driven dark sky projects. It's so important. It gives voice to I suppose sometimes as as ecologists we feel that we can have a lonely voice. Um, and, and so when a community is behind these kind of projects, it, it, it inspires us in what the work that we do. And it brings everybody along together rather than us being um, uh, naysayers or uh, anti-development. Um, it's, it's everybody working together and um, uh, with, with, I suppose, one, <laughs> uh, one vision, which would be... Um, which would be an important thing. And certainly with regards to dark skies, I think uh, it's a positive for everybody. Uh, Shin, I will, I think. Yes, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susan. And that was great. And I know that a lot of people reacted really well to the notion of the net gain for biodiversity. Um, we're familiar enough with the no net losses, but um, net gain is really, really good. And again, the lighting impact assessments are definitely needed. Uh, in Cork, we have a greenway, which is going right beside an SPA. And, you know, those conflict issues do occur mm -hmm. and we need voices as well to raise those issues because it's not that people are intentionally doing harm necessarily. You know, they, we need the sustainable travel, mm -hmm. but we need also to mm -hmm. highlight the impacts on um, nature and our biodiversity so that's really great um, and it's great work that you're doing so hopefully we'll have a few questions coming in later and we're now on to our final speaker of the night who probably hardly needs an introduction certainly to a lot of the audience I'm sure um, so Dr Niall Smith um, is the MTU head of research and head of MTU Black Rock Castle Observatory Niall is the founder director of the internationally award-winning Black Rock Castle Observatory. In 2017, he hosted, the, he was the host director for the International Space University Space Studies Program, which is the largest conference program ever to come to Cork, lasting a total of nine weeks and involving over 320 global space experts. Niall's research focuses on space topics, including ultra high precision photometry and the uses of small satellites in low earth orbit for a wide range of functions from high resolution imaging to space cyber security to rural broadband. He was the higher education representative on the national steering group for the Irish government's recently published space strategy for enterprise and considers space 4.0 to be a significant opportunity for the Irish business community. And he has a fantastic title for his talk. It says, the future can't be bright. So over to you, Nahal. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Bernie. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, I'm feeling much less confident than I did about an hour ago, having listened to those wonderful talks uh, that preceded uh, what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, the it, it's really great to, to to be able to have a, an opportunity to to talk here tonight. I'm going to take a bit of a, a different angle. Uh, from the previous speakers um, and uh, just wants to make a note actually that tonight is the 60th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin going into space. Uh, I thought that in some sense there was a, an interesting uh, connection between what we're doing now and what we were doing 60 years ago. 
there's a well-known program I think on the BBC called Who Do You Think You Are and it's really about our genealogy and trying to trying to link who we are with our grandparents our great-grandparents and and others and it's something that, that that fascinates me but astronomy and space which is an angle I'm going to look at tonight really actually asks us about this question itself as well and I think what we've all been outside uh, under a starlit sky uh, we can of how we're connected to that. We've seen megalithic structures dotted around the Irish landscape and the international landscape. And there is that sense when you look up at the sky that somehow it's bigger than you, but it's part of you. And we see this in our literature, Sean O'Casey's Juno and the Paycock famous quote about, I often looked up at the sky and asked myself the question, what is the moon? What is the stars? And can actually now answer some of those questions. And, and we can do that because we can see the skies above us. So start off and ask, what if you can see bright things in the sky? I'm only going to give one or two examples, but if you can see bright things in the sky, here's an example of a bright thing in the sky. It's a tumbling asteroid. Asteroids are large aggregates of rock which float around our solar system. By looking at the light from them, we can tell what they're made of. Why is that important? Well, 65 million years ago, we now know that a large one of these asteroids collided with the Earth, killed off the dinosaurs, and as a result of that, you and me uh, are sitting here tonight talking about dark skies and the future of, of light pollution. Earth sterilizing impacts, which is the, the, the name that NASA give to this, they're not just possible, they're, they're actually inevitable. So they happen every so often, much less frequently now, so let's not get too concerned about that on our way home tonight, but they do happen every so often. And they have fundamentally changed the history of you and me. Our genealogy was fundamentally changed by this collision. But we know this because we can observe objects in the sky now, and we know that because we can detect the light from them. Neil deGrasse, Tass, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's a, one of my favorite commentators, made a comment about the dinosaurs never saw that asteroid coming, our excuse. And from this point, making the, 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 the connection between being able to look what's going on in the universe and taking some action. For the first time, our species has the opportunity to look out, see what's coming our way, and do something about it. So what we leave for our future generations depends in part on what we do now. But what if we can see fainter things? What if we can actually go and see really faint parts of the sky? So here's an example of the star Sirius. And close to that, we're going to zoom in on a part of the sky. And what you're seeing here is a series of, of each of those points is a star very similar to the sun. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Some are red, some are blue. Red actually is cooler, blue is hotter. But as we zoom in more and more, um, we're seeing fainter and fainter objects. And we move from being able to see stars being able to see galaxies. And what we're doing is we're looking back in time. Generally, when you see fainter things, now this is not exclusively true, but generally when you see fainter things, you're looking further back in time. And as we look further back in time, uh, we see things which um, uh, maybe in one sense we, we hoped we would see, which is that the universe was smaller, that galaxies were colliding with each other much more frequently because galaxies actually do collide with one another. And by being able to see right back and visualize this, we can test our theories as to where the universe comes from with what we actually see in practice. And we end up with this fantastic model of our universe where 13.7 billion years ago, here on the left of the diagram, we now think the universe began in the Big Bang. It, it, it expanded quickly. Uh, a couple of hundred million years later, we had galaxies. Remember, galaxies are just aggregates of stars. And then as we moved on, we get to the present day where we have life on, on, on Earth appearing uh, after about 10 billion years or so. And present day is 13.7 billion years. So we can actually draw this picture because we can see the light. That's how we do it. There is no other way for us to do that other than if we can see the light from the distant stars and the distant galaxies. So our understanding of who we are fundamentally has relied completely on being able to detect light. If we think of the water molecule in, in all our bodies or indeed wherever there's a water molecule, well, the hydrogen in that water we think began or was generated pretty much at the beginning of the Big Bang, 13.7 years ago. But by contrast, the oxygen molecule was made somewhere else. We think it was made in stars which exploded. So you and me are composed of both things that were generated 13.7 billion years ago 
and and things that were generated, molecules, atoms and molecules that were generated, maybe 5 billion, maybe 10 billion. We don't actually know what stars made the oxygen in you and me, but we do know they weren't made 13.7 billion years ago. So we're actually linked intimately to the first few minutes of the universe and to everything that happened or, or lots of things that happened subsequently. And again, we know this because we can look out at the night sky. But we don't just look, when I say at light, we don't just look with the light that we think of. And this has been mentioned about the way that um, different animals see light differently. Well, we're actually in a sense no, no different, but we have the capability to expand that range of light that we can detect enormously. So radio, for example, is just another form of light. It's a, it's a type that we can't readily detect with our eyes, but we can detect with the right equipment. Because we're at the bottom of an atmosphere, that's a great thing, of course, because we need that to breathe, we can't actually detect certain types of radiation. So we have to go into space. And if you go into space, you can see other, what we call colors, so infrared, and still see optical, this is a beautiful picture of the Hubble Space Telescope. But you can see other wavelengths like ultraviolet, the type of ultraviolet that maybe bees would see on the surface of the Earth that would give us a sunburn. But you can see more ultraviolet when you go into space. And then you can see X-rays and you can see gamma rays. The reason why this is so important is if we can't detect all of this stuff, we can't build up this model of where we came from in the universe. So we can't tell where you and me came from if we can't see all of this information. But... That'd be great if it was just like that. And we could sort of do the mic drop, walk away and go home and say, we know where we all came from and we know where we're all going. But actually that model that I just showed a couple of minutes ago, based upon a lot of observation, is challenged. And some of you might have seen even recently in the last couple of weeks, there's been talk of a new form, a new force that operates in the universe. And even if we look now at the universe from the observations we can make, we know that about 5%, somewhere between 4 and 5% of the universe is the stuff that you can see or directly interact with. But there's about a, the other 95%, and we really don't know very much about it at all. So there's enormous questions for us to ask if we want to fill in that 95%. To do that as astronomers, we need access to the skies above. We can't close those off. We can't light pollute, because if we light pollute excessively, we can't see those faint objects. And if we can't see those faint objects, then all we can see is stuff that's bright and close by. And that's not enough if we want to come up with a model of the universe. And if we want to know where we came from, our genealogy, then we need that complete model of the universe. So this is a, a challenging time for the astronomy community because we're, we're living in an era where even some of our best sites through climate change uh, and also through light pollution are starting to lose the ability to see the very faintest objects in the sky. I wanted to just talk for the last bit of the, 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 the brief chat about Space 4.0 and Bernie mentioned that I am very interested in something called Space 4.0. So for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with the term, we're living in an era of sometimes we call Industry 4.0, where you have robotics or autonomous vehicles. And the, an the analogy in space is, is referred to as Space 4.0. The key thing about Space 4.0, uh, this is a, a graphic from the European Space Agency, is um, it, it, it can be perceived in, in different ways. And this is a challenge for our light pollution, as I'll point out in just a second. But traditionally, some of the Space 4.0 was looked at as, you know, if, you have, if you're low on your milk, you connect with a satellite and it orders something from the shop. Now that's not really very impactful. That, that's a pretty much a first world thing to do. So great for you if you need, if you need your fridge to tell you you're low on milk, but it really shouldn't be something that we get overly concerned about. There are, are rather bigger things for us to worry about. So the question is, can Space 4.0 help us with that? And Space 4.0 is really about more actors, smaller countries, uh, commercial entities being able to engage in the business of putting satellites up into space and hopefully, and this is where some of the arguments start, hopefully do something useful with those satellites. Nelson Mandela said something which, which has been reiterated or has been said before and since. He's a bit of a hero of mine, so I just thought I'd like to, 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 to say it as he said it. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. So in all our discussions tonight, 
what we're doing. And it's very clear from all the previous speakers and all of the fantastic work that's been done during Dark Sky Week is that we're educating people, we're educating each other because we're learning from each other. We're educating our, our government, our local authorities, and we're sharing be best practice. As technology improves, we're, we're using that for, for better types of lighting and so on. So education is dynamic and it is indeed a powerful weapon. If, however, you're one of the 800 million people who live in poverty in the world, education isn't something that's top of your priority list at the moment. Living is top of your priority list. In fact, living is probably much the only thing on your priority list. And so there's a huge challenge for us as a society to say, what can we do to help the 800 million people living in poverty? Well, one thing that we can do is we can help to accelerate their education. And there's one thing that the pandemic has taught us is that by having these type of Zooms and so on, we can connect each other so much better than we did, than we thought we could do even a year ago. Even though the backbone was there, we really weren't using it. I was have been constantly amazed by the number of things that have happened even in Ireland, where two years ago, you would have been told, no, you can't do that. You have to do this, you have to wait for this and so on. And the pandemic showed that when there is a, a globally connected will and determination that you can do it. Unfortunately, a lot of that, of course, is driven by the need to protect first world countries. But 800 million people, almost a billion people live in constant poverty. There's, there's a lot more who live in, in marginal and depending on how you define poverty, they live in poverty. So if you take the educational angle on, on issues, then this is a, 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 a 2018 map of global uh, broadband um, and think of the pandemic and think of the way broadband has saved us all really from becoming isolated during this pandemic however however you know it's been awkward working from home and all the rest so you can see if you, if you look at the black here that wherever there's black there's there's some reasonable broadband connectivity but huge swathes of africa in particular have, have effectively none at all indeed we could say that three billion people are not connected to the internet in any meaningful way so that means that we don't have the opportunity at the moment to provide education to those 3 billion people quickly. If we're going to do things the traditional way, it's going to be too expensive. It's going to be not climate neutral. It's going to have a, a large climate CO2 cost. And it's, it's going to take a, a period of time, which quite frankly, if you're alive now, isn't really very encouraging for you. If we look at the broadband map for Ireland, a similar type of thing, uh, we see that it's a bit, a bit fractured. If you're living in a rural area, you'll be very familiar that your broadband is probably patchy. Um, we can probably get around that because there's some broadband in most parts of Ireland. But this map shows the blue where the, 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 the government is providing the rollout and the orange is everywhere else. And you can see most of the country actually isn't everywhere else. Uh, there are some hotspots, the, the, the green uh, are, are lit up hotspots uh, and the grey are, are to be lit up uh, hotspots or hotspots that exist but for, for, for school, use by schools or, or limited numbers of individuals. So on a global level, we have a big problem. On a, on a, on a national level, we, we also have something of a problem. But there is a potential solution and then there's an issue with the solution, which will bring me to the end of my talk. So we're probably all familiar that uh, at the moment there, uh, there's a company called SpaceX who are one of a number of companies who have started to put up some satellites. And here we show a graphic, just uh, each of these, these sort of um, squares is a satellite, not to scale. And here you're just showing somebody in, New, in, in London uh, on the right-hand side, connecting via a bunch of satellites with somebody, in this case, on the west coast of the US in San Francisco. By putting up these satellites, we can rapidly make connectivity, not really between London and San Francisco, that's already connected. That's not where it gets interesting or, or really impactful. But where, where it does get impactful is if we, if we light up places like Africa. So we, we, we have that capability on our doorstep at, at the moment. And so for me as an astronomer, I start to get challenged by this issue and as somebody who believes in the, in the night sky and the preservation of the dark skies. This is an image which is, is a, it's a couple of minutes just focusing on a small part of the sky. You can see in it a number of stars, you can see in it some, um, this is a galaxy, and you can clearly see trails of light. So these trails are caused by, in this instance, satellites from the Starlink constellation, uh, and they're challenging uh, the way that we can see the night sky. They challenge it even from a, 
your eyes perspective. But if you're trying to look at that really faint stuff that I mentioned earlier, they really challenge it. And so this becomes an issue for us about how do we learn more about who we are and the universe we live in. But previously, this was maybe something of an esoteric question. But now the problem is we have a lot of people on the planet who need education, who need to be brought out of poverty, who need to be assisted. And we have a technology that can, in principle, do that rather rapidly, much more quickly than we could have done in our earlier history. So we have to worry about how this affects us on one score and what the benefits are on the other. And I have to say, and this is a phrase I find myself using more frequently, I'm conflicted by this because there's societal impacts of enormous benefit and there's scientific impacts of enormous detriment. And it's a matter of how do we marry the two together. I, I have some personal views on, on, on work that needs to be done to make these satellites really much, much, much darker than they are at the moment. There's been some small amounts of effort on that, really not good enough yet. Um, but I'm not aware, and I, I know there's some people on the call who know physics better than I do, but I'm not aware of any fundamental limitation to make satellites significantly dark. It'll still challenge the astronomical community up to a point, uh, but I think we'll, we'll do a lot better on the point of view of the, the, the general watching of the night sky. And over time, we'll have to see how well we can do. Um, the situation before just finishing and hopefully on a positive note can get a little bit worse if we're not careful. So this at the moment is an example of the number of objects that you just see now greater than one centimeter around the earth. And you can see the earth is co uh, cocooned in a, a lot of very small objects around one centimeter. This is space debris. And space debris is becoming a real problem for us because if we want to put those satellites up, for example, to help people uh, with broadband, then the problem now that we're finding is because there's so little regulation that we're starting to see debris causing failures of satellites. And then once satellites start to, 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 to tumble and so on, you can get this cascade effect and it, it could be quite serious going forward. So the, the, the night skies are starting to get lit up by objects which potentially have huge societal benefit to us and objects which potentially, if, they, if we don't mind them, if we allow them to, to, to fragment and so on, uh, can take all that away from us. So we're at this really important point in this space 4.0 about the whole idea of how we protect our night skies and how we, how we, how we continue that discussion about asking the question, who are we as individuals? Uh, and also while providing an opportunity for the people on the surface of the earth, which is what space 4.0 in some ways is not, not designed because nobody's designing it, but it's evolving into something that has benefit for the people back on earth or could do. We're at that point in history when it's the likes of you and me and the, the, the type of advocacy which has been mentioned several times tonight is needed when we join in as part of this conversation about what we do with the skies above. But just on my second last slide, it, it, it isn't all negative. The European Space Agency recently awarded a contract to a company called ClearSpace for the first um, uh, time the European Space Agency has done this to go up and, and prove the principles behind removing debris. So this is a, this is a graphic of a satellite which will, which is in orbit, Vespa, which, uh, um, and then you have this crab-like or spider-like um, 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 satellite, which will be launched in 2025 to go up. It'll grab onto it and then it'll deorbit it and burn it up in the atmosphere. Now, now that's not a perfectly good way of, of getting rid of things, but the debris that's up there is up there. And, and the, the, with two ways we can do it, really, well, three things, we can throw it out into space, we can bring it back down or we can try to keep on keep on moving its orbit around so it doesn't get in, in interfere with anything else. The, the latter one is really not on and sending it out to space is probably not on either. It just takes too much money to, 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 to get things completely away from the earth. The, the, the most credible approach is probably to burn it back up in the atmosphere. So we when we ask the question, who do you think you are? And when you think about who do you think you are, I think we have to uh, supplement that, but who will future generations think we were? 
at this moment, when we've got these different decisions to make about the skies above us, how we deal with the skies above us, how we protect them for future generations and use them to the benefit of current generations, how we can work together collectively to make that happen. For me, as an astronomer and as somebody who's passionate about the whole sustainable development goals, like, you know, we all are now at this stage as we start to understand them. I think this is a great time to be living because we have new technologies which have the potential for enormous impact uh, and if we do it in the correct way we can also protect our dark skies so that we can protect our rural communities we can protect our locations like mayo and and kerry i mean i i am so privileged to be here tonight even and i love every time i get an opportunity to 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 interact um, uh, with Georgia and her team in particular. It's just so fantastic. But it's about where this future will be. Who will future generations think we were? And from an astronomer's point of view, I think we all need to work together on putting forward the arguments so that we will be able to do all the things that we need to do and have future generations who look back and say, yeah, we made the right decisions back in, in 2021 and, and subsequent years. So uh, I'll leave it with that. Thanks very much, Niall. Um, great graphics and also very thought provoking. So I think there's a lot there that a lot of us who are more lay people really have to think about. And I can see already the comments coming in there from some of the astronomy community who are thinking about these things a lot more. But um, yeah, very challenging. And it's dilemmas. We, we're constantly faced with dilemmas, you know, the social good versus what, what else we're doing um, to harm our environment. So I suppose th those are things we are all challenged with. And the more that we come together at forums like this, the better. So we're gonna move on now to the Q&A and there are a good few questions there. And I'll just let Georgia introduce Brian Epsi, who's joining the panel as well. So Georgia, if you would introduce Brian and then we can get started. You can start with the first question. Okay, thanks, Bernie. Um, yeah, just uh, Brian hasn't um, hasn't presented tonight, but um, many of you will know him already. But for those that don't, um, Brian is an associate professor at Trinity of Astrophysics at Trinity College Dublin. Um, he was awarded last year um, the uh, Arthur Hogue and William T. Robinson Award by the International Dark Sky Association for uh, his services to. Uh, dark Skies, and um, he's Ireland's leading expert on light pollution. Uh, he's written several papers on the growth of light pollution, and he led the first survey of nighttime light in Ireland. Um, he has been um, extremely helpful to any groups who uh, want to get involved in researching light pollution and starting uh, dark sky um, applications for dark sky status. So um, yeah, he's a great guy, and he's joining our panel. So <laughs> welcome, Brian. Thank you, Georgia. Just going to put the spotlight on yourself, and I'll add spotlights to all the panel now. Thanks, George. I was, felt I was looking very big there for a couple of minutes. I didn't like to say it. Um, Bernie, do you want me to, to, to fire a question, or are you okay to fire the first one while I set the spotlights up? Um, I guess you said it all. <laughs> let's let's kick off with the questions then. Bernie, you're on mute there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first one is from Attractor Ivren. Um, it's got the most votes. So just a reminder for other people, vote up the questions you want us to ask. So Attractor is asking, um, the national lighting program referred to appears to have been just focused on retrofitting, what consideration was given and what consultation was done on the options and alternatives and the possibility of re-evaluating and reducing lighting requirement as part of the project. So clearly that's for you, Dara. So do you want to take that one? <clears throat> yeah, um, well, the business case kind of considered a huge amount of, um, I suppose, options. And um, in terms of the retrofitting, what's recognised is that, you know, that there was this energy savings target that the local authorities had to, had to 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 meet so the 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 program you know it 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 doesn't achieve everything in relation to public lighting, but it's the first step in many steps going forward into um, for 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 public lighting. So it's it's seen as the kind of the um, the 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 uh, the the big 
um, item that needed to be addressed. So, I mean, I know there's lots of, uh, you know, lots of people were kind of uh, considering or wanted to consider things like, you know, solar panels <clears throat> or turning off lights or um, um, various things like that. So, you know, it was trying to get one size fits all for the for the sector, uh, which was the, the objective there. In terms of consultation then, um, there was a, a technical working group which was made up of representatives from the local authority sector. Uh, we also kind of report to the, 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 the road management board and the, the CCMA. Um, uh, so there was, I suppose, consultation fully within, within the sector, but not necessarily outside the sector, um, uh, ma ma mainly to do with timelines and how, how to manage that process was, 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 would, be, would have been too onerous for, for the, the, the size of the team that we have. Okay, thanks, Dara. And I don't know, Brian, you were, I suppose you had a few meetings with Dara. Would you like to say anything? I suppose, it's, you know, the first time that this big lighting um, tender process has been done. Do you want to say anything about maybe, a is it is it positive? Do you feel that at least that people are open to? Um, yes, th okay. thanks for giving me the opportunity there. Um, I'm very happy that, that we've had such uh, positive contact with the RMO and, and our, our brief contacts with, with Transport Infrastructure Ireland. And I, you know, we're just trying to provide some input into that discussion. I think we need to open it out into more general issues. Um, and our concern was, was to extend things away from purely economics or carbon uh, to looking at biodiversity and the, the you know, numbers that were, are imp potentially impacted by the changes we're doing you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. So um, we've, you know, in Dark Sky Ireland, I think we've taken a number of different approaches. One is is to have some input into these discussions and, and to make it a two-way street. Um, but the other then is, the other leg is to uh, maybe try and develop some national policy as Sue was talking about. I think we need to get some documentation in there so that authorities have guidance and have we can have regulations to point to, you know, as to why we want to implement such, such policies. Um, it's, it's a neglected aspect of pollution up until the present. Only a few uh, authorities, I think, actually have light pollution written into their um, statements. Um, so as I said, we welcome, you know, interaction and are sort of developing our, our approach. Uh, well, you know, Dara and so on have to deal with certain practicalities. But I think we all realize that these are long-term changes that are going to have an impact that we need to have an, an input in now uh, in order to protect things down the line. Um, and particularly with climate change, um, even though light pollution may only be a marginal issue for some species, it's an additional one on top of all the changes that they're currently having to put up with. So, uh, you know, particularly on a small island, there's really nowhere for populations to move to. They have to adapt or die. Um, but I, th I think overall, I would say we've, we've had some positive discussions and we'd like to, as I say, open it out into the wider community. Okay, thanks, Brian. And I think Georgia has the next question coming up. I do. This one's for Sue um, from Charles Smith. Um, Sue, has the impact of recent installations of illuminated windmills, mobile phone towers around Ireland, etc., have been assessed with the impact to animal migrations, etc.? Uh, against documents like Nature Scott that you referred to in your talk. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Yes, um, I'm just having a. So I suppose for 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 the larger developments, um, for wind turbines and wind farms, they would be assessed with respect to that, and the Scottish National Guidance would be um one of the main one uh, I suppose guidance documents that we would refer to, um. The smaller the smaller kinds of developments then that you know those single turbines or ones that uh, don't necessarily come under the the radar of of ecological assess assessment some of those probably would slip through the net certainly but ones where they come in as planning applications and if they come to us and 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 uh, aren't necessarily within the umbrella of an eia um, but we we would see these applications and and would ra raise awareness and raise issues. Then they would uh, and and we reflect that back to the council. 
so uh, sorry, I, I'm not sure which question that one is. I'm just trying um, to look for it. It's in the Q and A. It's the top uh, voted one from Charles Smith. But I, okay. I guess so. The, these are um, assessed from the point of view of the, the structure itself, not necessarily because of the illumination. Um, it, would, it, it would be part of it, though, the yeah. illumination. As, yeah, yeah. Um, so often, as I was saying, illumination then can um, can then attract. So, you know, it, it attracts species, migrating species or attracts bats to toward it um, uh, because they're, you know, if there's a light and it's 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 pulling insects in, then it would attract it. But with red light, um, it would attract certain bird species. So so there are issues there, certainly. Um, um, but the Scottish, the Scottish Nature Scotch and, and uh, Scottish Natural Heritage um, are important guidance documents that we do refer to nationally. Yes. Great. And I see um, somebody has asked if you could share. Um, a little bit yes. Later yes. Thanks. Will I do one more, um, Bernie? Um, yeah, if you like the yeah, do um, another one there. Next one here is from Carol Loftus in Mulrani. I think we might know the answer to this one, but thank you. Um, great work, Dara. Delighted to see the lighting tone reduced from over four thousand Kelvin. Uh, any chance you can persuade the local authorities to re look at reducing to twenty seven hundred or less? Yeah, um, I suppose in relation to that, um, I, I and I only recall at the time. Um, the, the, the issue is that we're trying to retrofit um, um, on the existing public lighting infrastructure. So the, you know, the pole spacings um, already are predetermined um, and the lighting designer has to try to um, focus the light obviously um, under, the, under, the, under, the, under the pole or whatever. Uh, but he also has to ensure that there's, or she uh, has to ensure there's sufficient spread. Uh, and what's, what the concern would be in, in, in when you're working around the existing infrastructure is that, you know, you, 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 the, the, in relation to dark spots and, 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 and the like. So the issue then was kind of from a, from a contract um, perspective, we had to ensure that there was a sufficiently broad range of product um, available in the marketplace that we, di we didn't end up in a situation where only one supplier um, met the met the um, criteria. So, the 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 the, the color temperature was was settled on, I suppose, achieving a balance of of a, ensuring that there's sufficient range of products and maximizing competition. Um, um, but in the same time, the contract then does give the contractor an incentive to to uh, by good um, lighting design uh, maximize his energy savings and 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 and, and, and the like so from that point of view um what we're again what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a one size fits all kind of model um so that's why we had to settle on the um the the, the three thousand kelvin i mean that was a, a shift down from four thousand kelvin which is where we were going um however if there's particular areas that 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 the local authority would would require us to or require the project to achieve um uh, 2800 kelvin um um or, or, or lower that can be accommodated but it, that needs to be driven by the local authority they need to tell us um in this part of the project that you know these these are areas that we would prefer um um um, um warmer temperatures um, and then we can incorporate that into the contract documents. Um, so it's a, it's it's that that would need to come only come from from the local authorities themselves. Uh, but the one size fits all is 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 has settled on the on the on the three thousand Kelvin. So I, I hope that answers that question. Thank you, Dara. And if um if anyone uh, is interested, I have shared a link for the local authorities guidelines on Dark Sky Ireland which may be helpful to persuade the local authorities to take that leap. And uh, they have, as Dara said, a bit of autonomy. It just, um, they need to, to know a little bit more about it as well. Thank you, Dara. So, um, the next question is for you, Sue, um, again, and it's saying what um, baseline is being taken for biodiversity given the losses over the last 50 years? And there isn't a name with that one, so. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very tricky one and it's, it's a shifting baseline as well. Um, and that's the problem. 
Um, so when there is a, uh, again, it's back to when there's a project development um, and there has to be an ecological assessment done or when it's being requested, then it's up to the developer then to go and do baseline survey work if required or to assess and have a look at, at, at existing data that, that that's there. So the baseline has to be established um, and then and then the impacts assessed. So um, that's with respect to, to, to current um, uh, new developments. So, I mean, but it is shifting baseline, um, unfortunately. So, sorry, what was the, I'm trying to again find the question. Uh, um, yeah, it was just what baseline was being used given that the losses, we know the losses have yeah. been huge in the last 50 years, so. Yeah, so I mean, it is a baseline at that present time, though. That's that's the unfortunate thing. So, I mean, we're not looking back 50 years. Um, so that's why this net biodiversity gain is so, so important to try and, I suppose, claw back to, to try and um, uh, to restore habitats and restore populations. So that's the principles behind it. OK, thank you very much, Susan. Georgia, do you want to take the next one? Um, we have, uh, I'm just trying to have a quick read because it's quite a long question from uh, Karem uh, Astru Kuruglu, who um, is working on the Clock Jordan um, Eco Village lighting scheme. Um, so he's asking, how can we improve the planning requirements for dark sky projects in Ireland? Um, uh, current lighting criteria requested by the councils and municipalities can be tough to achieve in Ireland. Uh, which is funny since the UK is usually the one obsessed with health and safety. If we want dark skies to become more popular in Ireland, we need to see relaxation and standards for the towns, small communities to thrive. Every project is unique. Uh, I, just, I, I suppose really the question is how can we improve the planning requirements? We, we've kind of touched on it a bit. I don't know, Brian, you might want to maybe put a comment on that. Uh, you're on mute at the moment, but... I was going to bounce it to Dara. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Dara under pressure, so... <laughs> uh, well, if, if you'd like to take it, Dara, I mean, I, I could respond in general. You, you probably know a little bit more about the reg side. Yeah, yeah, well, I suppose, yeah. Um, as, uh, with planning and environmental legislation, it's, 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 it's extremely um, comprehensive, um, and it's, it's, we spend a significant amount of time trying to ensure that we're uh, fully compliant in relation to... Public lighting project. Uh, the 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 retrofit project was was um, um, settled on on doing a scheme around the as I mentioned the existing infrastructure so that um, uh, it wouldn't um, uh, require planning. I suppose the analogy is that it's what it is is an accelerated maintenance program uh, because the sons and sock te technology. Is, is 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 no longer being supported by manufacturers. So one way or another, the local authorities are are, are moving over to um, LEDs. But um, you, well, I suppose from from a from a local authority engineering kind of um, uh, project management kind of perspective, we 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 if if something requires planning, you know, we, we, through Part Eight or whatever, we, we we follow that process. So I suppose the important thing is that. If, if people feel that the, uh, there's greater need for planning in relation to public lighting or, or any type of lighting, but then maybe that needs to be fed through um, um, to, 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 to the Department of Environment so that that type of thinking um, gets captured at national level and then, and then that filtrates down to the local authorities because ultimately we, we, we follow um, uh, planning um, and environmental legislation and policies um, as, as, as set out, um, but we wouldn't necessarily drive that or, 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 or um, um, uh, set that out without, without, without a, the, the, the overarching um, um, support or the overarching kind of um, message coming from, from, from government. Um, <clears throat> but in that regard, it's, you know, it, that takes time, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, even coordinating, you know, the large number of local authorities, there's a huge amount of time just spent in, um, in consultation to achieve consensus, and that takes that takes up a huge amount of time. 
Um, so that's something that maybe needs to be thought about. But I would think that any planning requirements relating to public lighting, if people feel that there's there, that there, there should be greater engagement, or the, you know, that has to come from from the top down. I think. Could could you just comment on flexibility? I mean, we we did uh, discuss flexibility within the uh, the changeover, but I know from ILP. Uh, input is that uh, certainly in the UK, there is no right to light. So you can actually make a, a policy about why you're lighting to maybe a lower light level, but we don't seem to go that route here in Ireland. But there is there flexibility at the local authority to, to actually change regs as for instance, in Mayo and Kerry? Um, well, I suppose, yeah, I mean, Mayo are part of the, um, uh, this project and the they are they they are also um, one of the lead local authorities in the for the northwest region. So very much, you know, they would have an input into um, um, the message from dark skies in relation to um, um, in relation to the development of the project. But, um, but I mean, just in, in terms of what what's currently done, uh, seen from our discussions, that there is a certain amount of flexibility if the council wishes it. Um, yeah, the, yeah. The nor we, European norms I, I are suppose, norms. Exactly. Yeah, I suppose we are servants to the local authorities, so we, you know we carry out work on their behalf effectively. So if there's specific um, requirements, then we you know, um, and that 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 works through our governance structure. Well, then yeah, we 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 implement that. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think. So um, I'm going to I'm going to skip over to one and maybe Bet Betamea and um, maybe Brian as well. It's one that challenges all of us who are advocating for um, dark skies, and it's from Ivan Cudahy. Now there is another one about e electromagnetic spectrum, and I'll go back to that. But I think this is one that we all face. How do we balance the need for public safety from walking through city parks at night time, both from health and safety? preventing trips falls, but also personal safety of those traversing or linking two city neighborhoods. So um, this is a real challenge for all our groups trying to advocate. So any comment, maybe Beta Maya, and then <laughs> anyone else who wants to come in on that one? No, that's a great question. <laughs> the, the number one comment that, that I get personally when talking about dark skies is, all right, we're all in, but like, what about safety, you know? Um, and interestingly, dark lighting has not actually ever been proven to increase safety in any way, nor darkness to decrease it. Um, but it definitely does enhance our feeling of safety and that is important for making people feel safe in an area. So I think kind of, as we said earlier, it's about dark sky, not dark ground and lighting can be done well and in a way that makes people feel safe. And dark sky friendly lighting when done well actually increases safety because it reduces the glare that's coming into your eye and helps you see better as you're walking around in these lit areas and also decreases that contrast so you're not looking into dark shadows where people could actually be hiding. There's some pretty interesting photos of like before and after shielding of lights and being able to actually see a person standing in a doorway as opposed to light. And also in, in a lot of studies, it's been found that the most amount of violent crimes actually happen during the day. Uh, we just think about them as happening at night because we're all scared of the dark. And so I also think a big part of this issue is just changing our cultural perception of nighttime and changing how we value darkness and not seeing it as such a scary, um, scary place and, and having helping people just feel more comfortable in the dark and to appreciate what darkness brings. So. So does anybody else want to come in on that? Yeah, just uh, kick in. I mean, I, I think that's an important point. And if you look at some of the documentation, um, a lot of low authorities or, or uh, lighting companies will actually put in that word, you know, perception. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's something that's hard to get rid of. So we can be very wary of strangers, although statistically, for instance, a lot of attacks occur with people that you actually know. Um, a, a lot of burglaries happen during the daytime and you know, studies of, in the UK of, of why people pick certain houses, it's not because they're lit. It's, it's more a question about whether they're isolated or um, you know, there's, there's no dogs and things like that. 
But our perception is that light is a security blanket. And if we leave the lights on outside and we're not there to see them, that somehow it'll magically keep people away. <laughs> and it's not actually the case. Um, you're much better off lighting inside the house. And I think that used to be a recommendation, certainly used to be a recommendation from the guards. Um, whereas putting a big bright light outside and showing there was no one around was maybe detrimental. Um, but perception like, you know, the perception of risk from airplane disasters, you know, we can be scared of those. You're more likely to be killed by crossing the road. Um, but it's, it's very hard to overcome and, and light has these issues. And as Betty Mayo said, um, there's, there are certain misunderstandings about light. So the more light you have is perceived to be better. Uh, some of this may hark back to, you know, the feeling of comfort or security by being around the campfire at night. Um, but for instance, you have bright light, you have a, a sheet of white paper on the snow, it's going to be very hard to see no matter how bright the light is. It's light, work, or eyesight works by contrast. And low levels of good quality light, and I think this is what Dara was getting at as well, is if we light the situation appropriately, it is a lot more effective than just throwing a lot more energy at it. Uh, and this is something that we need to get across as well in, in outreach and in dealing with councils. It's, it's a very complex issue, um, but I think there's, there's a lot of perceptions, there are a lot of knee jerks. Um, and it, it, for instance, in the UK, in, in certain areas, um, they wanted to believe that uh, you know, uh, crimes went up when they turned off lights after midnight. And in fact, in, in quite a few of those areas, when they studied the statistics, um, they may be marginally improved uh, after dark because you don't roam around a dark site uh, without needing a light if it's an area you're not used to. Um, and for instance, in the farms and so on, uh, you know, if you have people roaming around a farmyard, if they're from outside, they probably want to use a light. Whereas if you light it up, they can see exactly where they want to go and which areas are probably going to be the areas that are being, are tr being trying to be protected and where might valuable equipment might be located, for instance. So it's a, it's a question about perception. And uh, again, it's another one of those education questions for, at, at all levels. Yeah, and, and just for Ivan, because I know Ivan, um, you know, for it, when I first came to this, you know, realizing that it takes 20 minutes for your eyes to adjust to the dark. So maybe if you allow yourself the time to let your eyes adjust to the dark, then you won't trip over things either. So if you're worried about that. So I'll just ask the electromagnetic question and then pass over to Georgia. So it's from Richard Sessions and he wants to know, is there any consideration given for new lighting installations to not produce unwanted pollution in any part of the electromagnetic spectrum, such as RFI from LED drivers? Is that for me? <laughs> I'd say so, Dara. I'd say you better take it. Uh, I, I actually we can't the answer the question. For, we'll get I, a I'm question a, for uh, Niall uh, in a minute, but um, yeah. I'm, I, 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 I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm not qualified to answer that question, so I, I can't because I'm, I rely on, on um, a technical working group and, and technical consultants to help um, set out this specification, so I, I, I personally can't answer that at the moment. Thank you. So maybe we'll finish up with a question for Niall because we can't let him escape all evening. <laughs> so Georgie, I think there's one coming up there for, that's addressed to Niall. There is Niall, yeah. Um, it's from Charles Smith and he's asking Niall, uh, with plans for micro satellites to provide 5G coverage, there's been a lot of discussion in the International Telecommunications Union strict engineering community because of interference with weather satellites important for monitoring climate change in addition to space to space debris any thoughts on that yes um so at the moment one of the big issues is that the use of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum by satellites isn't covered by any global regulation so if you're in the us and you want to um you want to launch a satellite you have to get permission from the Federal Communications Commission, but that's solely US law. Uh, and you may or may not be interfering with an Irish launch satellite, for example. Now we don't actually have any 
any legislation covering or permitting the launch of satellites or indeed the operation of Irish owned satellites. Yes, um, that's still a kind of a, 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 a work in progress. So at the moment it's a little bit like the Wild West and that is, that is something of an issue at, at the minute, absolutely. And there is, the, there is a danger of interference uh, and there is a danger that has a plethora of roles that, um, that we will see some issues. So there's a lot of work being done at the moment because um, the one of the, what, the well, it, it's it's difficult to know where things go, are going forward. But for, for those of you old enough to remember the likes of VHS and Betamax and so on, uh, and because uh, when I was going up, it was which will be which will survive VHS or Betamax. These were the tapes we used to to record stuff and all the rest. And 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 some some somebody's like 5G. 5G is a global standard, for example. The actual 5G is a global standard. The way you use the 5G, however, can be used slightly differently. And it it, it if you don't adhere to the standard as such, but say you do, that's where the that's where the issues arise. And now we're moving into 6G. But uh, the, the the what's what's really likely to to determine this is um uh whether or not, for example, if you're using something it works better than your competitors so we, we may see a couple of systems at the moment you have maybe tens of systems in operation that that's likely to settle down to a smaller number of regulated systems because the market actually makes more money that way and and space 4.0 has at a as a core to it the um the requirement for an element of it not to lose money. For example, in 2019, 75% of the investment in space came from the non-public uh, sector, so it was private sector money. Uh, the first time that that, that has happened since, uh, since we launched Sputnik. So it's a challenge, it's an issue. I, I am concerned, people who look at this are concerned. Just as, as, a, as a final observation, there's, there's a lot of motion at the moment towards optical communications. So one of the things that we really need to do if we're to compete, um, when I say we, I don't launch satellites, if, if we're to use satellites to compete, we need to see where we can push the bandwidth. And, and to push the bandwidth, you really need to, to go into the optical, and that's lasers. L tunable broadband lasers, uh, they, don't, they don't suffer the same issues that you would see from some of this RF stuff. So, so there's some really exciting technology, the European Space Agency is pushing very hard on the development of some of this technology. We have some in Ireland, some very forward looking companies who are working on using lasers to communicate with satellites. That will increase the bandwidth, it will decrease the interference. Um, and uh, ultimately, it is a, is it, it's a superior way to do this communications. Um, SpaceX have already done some inter-satellite uh, tests that we know of that could have been done by, by military, um, by governments through military applications, but the first commercial ones we know of have been done by SpaceX, and, and they get up to gigabit transmissions between satellites at the moment, even in beta tests. So it's a rapidly evolving area, and rapidly evolving has its problems, and there are problems at the moment. Uh, just to, I, I would say, will we likely see that we won't be able to to, to connect with the, the meteorological satellites? I, I, I would be very surprised if it went that, that far. But there's nothing to stop a to, to use the the famous a rogue state um, uh, to, to to use some sort of James Bondism uh, setting up satellites that are going to do all sorts of bad things. I mean that, that 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 could in principle happen for a period of time. But once you put up lots and lots and lots of satellites, there's all sorts of security come in just on on the basis that you have so much activity there. It's very hard to disrupt it all completely. So you have a lot of redundancy built into these constellations. Thanks very much, Niall. Um, very great. comprehensive answer. Uh, and also there's loads more questions and we could be here for another hour, but it's already, um, you know, um, seven minutes past nine on my um, on my laptop. So I guess we better um, wrap up. But I think Georgia has another poll to show you in a minute. But first of all, I'd really like, like to thank everybody who has attended um, this session. It's really great that so many of you have been here. And a special thanks to all of our speakers. Unfortunately, Betta Maya had to leave. Um, she had another engagement because of course it's daytime where she is. So we thank her. We thank um, Dara Quill. Um, I'd like to thank Susan Callahan and also to Niall Smith, all of you for giving your time and Brian for joining the panel. And a special thanks to Georgia. I don't know, she, she just does amazing work. We're all 
very inspired by Mayo and um, she's a great collaborator as well. And I don't think she mentioned at the beginning, you know, a, a, a full introduction to herself, but Georgia has joined the International Committee of the International Dark Sky Association. So just congratulations. And it's great as well that Georgia is um, representing Ireland there. So that, that's really fantastic. So Georgia, um, maybe that's it. Maybe you have a few words of thanks as well and, um, and to show them Mindy and that's it. Thank you, Bernie. Well, uh, well just on, on the committee, if I can just um, say I've shared a form, it's the, the real work we need to do is to gather the purpose of this international committee is to be able to feed back to the Dark Sky Association's board, um, the international committee's views and to enable them to give us the supports that we need. So it's really important if we can do anything that we can hear your voices uh, through the form and that would be um, Really appreciated. Very quickly, we had a poll earlier and um, I'm sharing the results at the moment. So we just wanted to see what people felt about streetlights. Do we need them on all night or not? Bearing in mind, we have them on over 4,000 hours at the moment. So I think the results speak for themselves um, from people who attending this um, event, obviously. And I'll share them afterwards so we don't have to look at them uh, right now. We'll share them on our uh, social media and we also just wanted to share where you were all from just to say thank you again for joining us um, through the evening and we had a great representation for uh, different countries different counties great for dark sky ireland and its future so um, all the panelists and speakers thank you and all the attendees thank you and i think that's uh, enough said have a great evening thank you thanks very much Thanks. Well done, George. Thanks. Well done. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Can I go now? You can go. <laughs> you can go. Everybody can go. It was a long session. Thank you so much, though. That's well great. done. Must get my dinner. <laughs> Thank you, Dara. My goodness, that's Take care. Time. Talk later. Bye. Uh, well, Georgia, there was there was a question I just responded to. Uh, how's she gone? I'll have oh, a I, I cleared it off about the the SQMs. I'll have them all um, downloaded. Yeah, I saw that as well. Um, 